Book 2. Assembly and Muster of Armies. Now slept the gods, and those who fought at Troy horse handlers, charioteers the long night through, but slumber had no power over Zeus, who pondered in the night how to exalt Achilles, how in his absence to destroy Achaeans in windrows at the ships. He thought it best to send to Agamemnon that same night a fatal dream. Calling the dream he said, sinister dream, go down amid the fast ships of Achaia, enter Lord Agamemnon's quarters, tell him everything, point by point, as I command you, let him prepare the long-haired earls of Achaia to fight at once. Now he may take by storm the spacious town of Troy. The Olympians, tell him, are of two minds no longer, Heros weighed them, and black days overhang the men of Troy. The dream departed at his word, descending swift as wind to where the long ships lay, and sought the son of Atreus. In his hut he found him sleeping, drifted all about with balm of slumber. At the marshal's pillow standing still, the dream took shape as Nelia's son, old Nestor. Agamemnon deferred to Nestor most, of all his peers, so in his guise the dream spoke to the dreamer, sleeping, son of Atreus, tamer of horses. You should not sleep all night, not as a captain responsible for his men, with many duties, a great voice in the conferences of war. Follow me closely, I am a messenger from Zeus, who is far away but holds you dear. Prepare the troops, he said, to take the field without delay, now may you take by storm the spacious town of Troy. The Olympian gods are of two minds no longer, Heros pleading swayed them all, and bitter days from Zeus await the Trojans. Hold on to this message against forgetfulness in tides of day when blissful sleep is gone. On this the dream withdrew into the night, and left the man to envision, wrapped, all that was not to be, thinking that day to conquer Priam's town. O oh childish trust! What action lay ahead in the mind of Zeus he could not know what grief and wounds from shock of combat in the field, alike for Trojans and Achaeans. Waking, he heard the dream voice ringing round him still, and sat up straight to pull his tunic on, a fresh one, never worn before. He shook his cloak around him, tied his shining feet in fitted sandals, hung upon his shoulder baldric and long sword, hilled all in silver, and, taking his dynastic staff in hand, he made his way among the ships. Pure dawn had reached Olympo's mighty side, heralding day for Zeus and all the gods, as Agamemnon, the Lord Marshal, met his clarion criers and directed them to call the unshorn Achaeans to full assembly. The call sang out, and quickly they assembled. But first, alongside Nestor's ship, he held a council with his peers there he convened them and put a subtle plan before them, saying, Hear me, friends. A vision in a dream has come to me in the starry night a figure in height and bearing very close to Nestor, standing above my pillow, saying to me, Sleeping, son of Atreus, tamer of horses? You should not sleep all night, not as a captain responsible for his men, with many duties, a great voice in the conferences of war. Follow me closely, I am a messenger from Zeus, who is far away but holds you dear. Prepare the troops, he said, to take the field without delay, now may you take by storm the spacious town of Troy. The Olympian gods are of two minds no longer, Heros pleading swayed them all, and bitter days from Zeus await the Trojans. Hold on to this message. When he had said all this, the phantasm departed like a bird, and slumber left me. Look to it then, we arm the troops for action, but let me test them first, in that harangue that custom calls for. What I shall propose is flight in the long ships. You must hold them back, speaking each one from where he stands. How curtly he told his curious plan, and took his seat. Now stood Lord Nestor of the sandy shore of Pylos, in concern for them, and spoke, friends, lord and captains of the Argives, if any other man had told this dream, a fiction, we should call it, we'd be wary. But he who saw the vision is our king. Up with you, and we'll put the men in arms. On this he turned and led the way from council, and all the rest, staff bearing counsellors, rose and obeyed their marshal. From the camp the troops were turning out now, thick as bees that issue from some crevice in a rock face, endlessly pouring forth, to make a cluster and swarm on blooms of summer here and there, glinting and droning, busy in bright air. Like bees innumerable from ships and huts down the deep foreshore streamed those regiments toward the assembly ground and rumour blazed among them like a cry ascent from Zeus. Turmoil grew in the great field as they entered and sat down, clangorous companies, the ground under them groaning, hubbub everywhere. Now nine men, criers, shouted to compose them, quiet. Quiet. Attention. Hear our captains. Then all strove to their seats and hushed their din. 
Before them now arose Lord Agamemnon, holding the staff Hephaestos fashioned once and took pains fashioning. It was a gift from him to the son of Kronos, Lordly Zeus, who gave it to the bright pathfinder, Hermes. Hermes handed it on in turn to Pelops, famous charioteer, Pelops to Atreus, and Atreus gave it to the sheepherder Thyestes, he to Agamemnon, king and lord of many islands, of all Argos the very same who leaning on it now spoke out among the Argives, friends, fighters, Danans, companions of ours, the son of Kronos has entangled me in cruel folly, wayward god. He promised solemnly that I should not sail before I stormed the inner town of Troy. Crookedness and duplicity, it is clear. He calls me to return to Argos beaten, after these many losses. That must be his will and his good pleasure, who knows why. Many a great town's height has he destroyed and will destroy, being supreme in power. Shameful indeed that future men should hear we fought so long here, with such weight of arms, all uselessly. We made long war for nothing, never an end to it, though we had the odds. The odds if we Achaeans and the Trojans should hold a truce and tally on both sides, on one side native Trojans, on the other Achaean troops drawn up in squads of ten, and each squad took one Trojan for a steward, then many squads would go unserved. I tell you, Achaean men so far outnumber those whose home is Troy. But the allies are there. From many Asian cities came these lances, and it is they who hedge me out and hinder me from plundering the fortress town of Troy. Under great Zeus nine years have passed away, making ship timbers rot, old tackle fray, while overseas our wives and children still await us in our halls. And yet the mission on which we came is far from being done. Well and good, let us act on what I say, retreat. Embark for our own fatherland. We cannot hope any longer to take Troy. He made their hearts leap in their breasts, the rank and file, who had no warning of his plan, and all that throng, aroused, began to surge as ground swells do on dark Icarian deeps under the south and east wind healing down from farther Zeus cloudland or a field of standing grain when wind puffs from the west cross it in billows, and the tasseled ears are bent and tossed, just so moved this assembly. Shouting confusedly, they all began to scramble for the ships. High in the air a dust cloud from their scuffling rose, commands rang back and forth to man the cables, haul the black ships to the salt immortal sea. They cleared the launching ways, their hearts on home, and shouts went up as props were pulled away. Thus, overriding their own destiny, the Argives might have had their voyage homeward, had Heron not resorted to Athena and cried, Can you believe it? Tireless daughter of Zeus who bears the shield of cloud, will they put out for home this way, the Argives, embarking on the broad back of the sea? How could they now abandon Helen, princess of Argos leave her in Priam's hands, the boast of every Trojan? Helen, for whom Achaeans died by thousands far from home. Ah, go down through the ranks of men-at-arms, in your mild way dissuade them, one by one, from hauling out their graceful ships to sea. The grey-eyed goddess Athena obeyed her, diving swifter than wind, down from the crests of Olympos, to earth amid the long ships. There she found Odysseus, peer of Zeus in stratagems, holding his ground. He had not touched the prow of his black ship, not he, for anguish filled him, heart and soul, and halting near him now, the grey-eyed goddess made her plea to him, son of Let's and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, must all of you take oars in the long ships in flight to your old country? leaving Helen in Priam's hands that Argive grace, to be the boast of every Trojan? Helen, for whom Achaeans died by thousands, far from home? No, no, take heart, and go among the men, in your mild way dissuade them, one by one, from hauling out their graceful ships to sea. Knowing the goddess' clear word when he heard it, Odysseus broke into a run. He tossed his cloak to be picked up by his lieutenant, Eurobates of Ithaca, and wheeling close to the silent figure of Agamemnon relieved him of his great dynastic staff, then ran on toward the ships. Each time he met an officer or man of rank he paused and in his ear he said, Don't be a fool. It isn't like you to desert the field the way some coward would. Come, halt, command the troops back to their seats. You don't yet know what Agamemnon means. He means to test us, and something punitive comes next. Not everyone could hear what he proposed just now in council. Heaven forbid he cripple, in his rage, the army he commands. There's passion in kings, they hold power from Zeus, they are dear to Zeus. But when Odysseus met some common soldier bawling still, he drove him back, he swung upon him with his staff and told him. Fool, go back, sit down, listen to better men unfit for soldiering as you are, weak sister, counting for nothing in battle or in council. 
Shall we all wield the power of kings? We can not, and many masters are no good at all. Let there be one commander, one authority, holding his royal staff and precedence from Zeus, the son of crooked-minded Kronos, one to command the rest. So he himself in his commanding way went through the army, and back to the assembly ground they streamed from ships and huts with multitudinous roar, as when a coma from the windy sea on a majestic beach goes thundering down, and the ebb seeds offshore. So all subsided, except one man who still railed on a lone Thersites, a blabbing soldier, who had an impudent way with officers, thinking himself amusing to the troops the most obnoxious rogue who went to Troy. Bow-legged, with one limping leg, and shoulders rounded above his chest, he had a skull quite conical, and mangy fuzz-like mould. Odious to Achilles this man was, and to Odysseus, having yapped at both, but this time he berated Agamemnon at whom in fact the troops were furious lifting his voice and jeering, Agamemnon. What have you got to groan about? What more can you gape after? Bronze fills all your huts, bronze and the hottest girls we hand them over to you, you first, when any stronghold falls. Or is it gold you lack? A Trojan father will bring you gold in ransom for his boy though I or some foot soldier like myself wrote the prisoner in. Or a new woman to lie with, couple with, keep stowed away for private use is that your heart's desire? You send us back to bloody war for that? Comrades! Are you women of Achaia? I say we pull away for home, and leave him here on the beach to lay his captive girls. Let him find out if we troops are dispensable when he loses us. Contempt is all he shows for a man twice his quality, by keeping Achilles' woman that he snatched away. But there's no bile, no bad blood in Achilles, he lets it go. Sir, if he drew his blade, you'd never abuse another man. So boldly Thersites baited Marshal Agamemnon, till at his side, abruptly, Odysseus halted, glaring, and grimly said, You spellbinder! You sack of wind! Be still! Will you stand up to officers alone? Of all who came here to beleaguer Troy I say there is no soldier worse than you. Better not raise your voice to your commanders, or rail at them, after you lie awake with nothing on your mind but shipping home. We have no notion, none, how this campaign may yet turn out. Who knows if we sail homeward in victory or defeat? Yet you bleat on, defaming the Lord Marshal Agamemnon because our Dane and veterans award him plentiful gifts of war. You sicken me. Here is my promise, and it will be kept, if once again I hear your whining voice, I hope Odysseus' head may be knocked loose from his own shoulders, hope I may no longer be called the father of Telemachos, if I do not take hold of you and strip you yes, even of the shirt that hides your scut. From this assembly ground I'll drive you howling and whip you like a dog into the ships. At this he struck him sharply with his staff on ribs and shoulders. The poor devil quailed, and a welling tear fell from his eyes. A scarlet welt, raised by the golden-studded staff, sprang out upon his back. Then, cowering down in fear and pain, he blinked like an imbecile and wiped his tears upon his arms. The soldiers, for all their irritation, fell to laughing at the man's disarray. You might have heard one fellow, glancing at his neighbor, say, oh, what a clout. A thousand times Odysseus has done good work, thinking out ways to fight or showing how you do it, this time, though, he's done the best deed of the war, making that poisonous clown capsize. By God, a long, long time will pass before our hero cares to call down his chief again. The crowd took it in this way. But the raider of cities, Odysseus, with his staff, stood upright there, and at his side grey-eyed Athena stood in aspect like a crier, calling. Silence, that every man, front rank and rear alike, might hear his words and weigh what he proposed. Now for their sake he spoke, Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, king, your troops are willing to let you seem disgraced in all men's eyes, they will not carry through the work they swore to en route from Argos, from the blue grass land, never to turn back till they plundered Troy. No, now like callow boys or widowed women they wail to one another to go home. I grant this hardship wearying to everyone. I grant the urge to go. Who can forget, one month at sea no more far from his wife will make a raider sick of the rowing bench, sick of his ship, as gales and rising seas delay him, even a month. As for ourselves, now is the ninth year that we keep the siege. No wonder at it, then, I cannot blame you men for sickening by the beach ships. Ah, but still it would be utter shame to stay so long and sail home empty-handed. Hold on hard, dear friends. Come, sweat it out, until at least we learn if Calchas made true prophecy or not. 
Here is a thing we cannot help remembering, and every man of you whom death has spared can testify, one day, just when the ships had staged at all this, loaded, every one, with woe for Priam and the men of Troy, we gathered round a fountain by the altars, performing sacrifices to the gods under a dappled sycamore. The water welled up shining there, and in that place the great portent appeared. A blood-red serpent whom Zeus himself sent gliding to the light, blood-chilling, silent, from beneath our altar, twined and swiftly spiralled up the tree. There were some fledgling sparrows, baby things, hunched in their downy wings just eight of these among the leaves along the topmost bough, and a ninth bird, the mother who had hatched them. The serpent slid to the babies and devoured them, all cheeping pitifully, while their mother fluttered and shrilled in her distress. He coiled and sprang to catch her by one frantic wing. After the snake had gorged upon them all, the god who sent him turned him to an omen, turned him to stone, hid him in stone a wonder worked by the son of crooked-minded Kronos and we stood awed by what had come to pass. Seeing this portent of the gods had visited our sacrifices, Calchas told the meaning before us all, at once. He said, dumbfounded, are you, gentlemen of Achaia? Here was a portent for us, and a great one, granted us by inscrutable Zeus a promise long to be in fulfilment but the fame of that event will never die. Consider, the snake devoured fledglings and their mother, the little ones were eight, and she made nine. Nine other years that we shall wage this war, and in the tenth we'll take the spacious town. That was his explanation of the sign. Oh, see now, how it all comes true. Hold out, Achaeans with your gear of war, campaigners, hold on the beachhead till we take the town. After the speech a great shout from the Argives echoed fiercely among the ships, they cried, I, to noble Odysseus' words. Then Nestor, lord of Gerenia, charioteer, addressed them, lamentable, the way you men have talked, like boys, like children, strangers to stern war. What will become of our sworn oaths and pacts? To the flames, you mean to say, with battle plans, soldierly calculations, covenants our right hands pledged and pledged with unmixed wine? Once we could trust in these. But wrangling now and high words dissipate them, and we cannot turn up a remedy, though we talk for days. Son of Atreus, be as you were before, inflexible, commit the troops to combat, let those go rot, those few, who take their counsel apart from the Achaeans. They can win nothing by it. They would sail for Argos before they know if what the Lord Zeus promised will be proved false or true. I think myself the power above us nodded on that day when the Argives put to sea in their fast sailing ships, with death aboard and doom for Trojans. Forking out of heaven, he lightened on the right a fateful sign. Therefore let no man press for our return before he beds down with some Trojan wife, to avenge the struggles and the groans of Helen. If any man would sooner die than stay, let him lay hand upon his ship he meets his death and doom before the rest. My lord, yourself be otherwise persuaded. What I am going to say is not a trifle to toss aside, marshal the troops by nations and then again by clans, Lord Agamemnon, clan in support of clan, nation of nation. If you will do this, and they carry it out, you may find out which captains are poltroons and which are valorous, foot soldiers, too, as each will fight before his clansmen's eyes when clans make up our units in the battle. You can discern then if your siege has failed by heaven's will or men's faint-heartedness and foolishness in war. Lord Agamemnon made reply, Believe me, sir, once more you win us all with your proposals here. O oh, Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, give me ten more to plan with me like this among the Achaeans. Priam's fortress then falls in a day, our own hands prey and spoil. But Zeus the Storm King sent me misery, plunging me into futile brawls and feuds. I mean Achilles and myself. We fought like enemies, in words, over a girl and I gave way to anger first. We too if we could ever think as one, the Trojans' evil day would be postponed no longer. Take your meal, now, we prepare for combat. Let every man be sure his point is wetted, his shield well slung. Let every charioteer give fodder to his battle team, inspect his wheels and car, and put his mind on war, so we may bear ourselves as men all day in the grim battle. There will be no respite, no break at all unless night coming on dissolve the battle lines and rage of men. The shield strap will be sweat soaked on your ribs, your hand will ache and stiffen on the spear's haft, and sweat will drench the horse's flanks that toil to pull your polished car. But let me see one man of you willing to drop out one man skulking around the ships, and from that instant he has no chance against the dogs and kites. 
Being so dismissed, the Argives roared, as when upon some cape a sea roused by the south wind roars on a jutting point of rock, a target winds and waves will never let alone, from any quarter rising. So the soldiers got to their feet and scattered to the ships to send up smoke from campfires and be fed. But first, to one of the gods who never die, each man resigned his bit and made his prayer to keep away from death in that day's fighting. As for Lord Agamemnon, their commander, a fattened ox he chose for sacrifice to Zeus the overlord of heaven calling round him the senior captains of the Achaean host, Nestor, then Lord Idomeneus, then those two lords who bore the name of Aias, then the son of Tydeus and, sixth, Odysseus, the peer of Zeus in Warcraft. Menelaus, lord of the war cry, needed no summoning, he knew and shared the duties of his brother. Around the ox they stood, and took up barley, and Agamemnon prayed on their behalf, O Excellency, O Majesty, O Zeus beyond the storm cloud, dwelling in high air, let not the sun go down upon this day into the western gloom, before I tumble Priam's blackened roof tree down, exploding fire through his portals. Let me rip with my bronze point the shirt that clings on Hector and slash his ribs. May throngs around him lie his friends, head down in dust, biting dry ground. But Zeus would not accomplish these desires. He took the ox, but added woe on woe. When prayers were said and grains of barley strewn, they held the bullock for the knife and flayed him, cutting out joints and wrapping these in fat, two layers, folded, with raw strips of flesh, to burn on cloven faggots, and the tripes they spitted to be broiled. When every joint had been consumed, and kidneys had been tasted, they sliced the chines and quarters for the spits, roasted them evenly and drew them off. The meal being now prepared and all work done, they feasted royally and put away desire for meat and drink. Then Nestor spoke, Excellency, Lord Marshal Agamemnon, we shall do well to tarry here no longer, we officers, in our circle. Let us not postpone the work heaven put into our hands. Let criers among the Achaean men-at-arms muster our troops along the ships. Ourselves, we'll pass together down the Achaean lines to rouse their appetite for war. And Agamemnon, marshal of the army, turned at once, telling his criers to send out shrill and clear to all Achaean troops the call to battle. The cry went out, the men came crowding, officers from their commander's side went swiftly down to form each unit and the grey-eyed goddess Athena kept the pace behind them, bearing her shield of storm, immortal and august, whose hundred golden plaited tassels, worth a hecatom each one, floated in air. So down the ranks that dazzling goddess went to stir the attack, and each man in his heart grew strong to fight and never quit the melee, for at her passage war itself became lovelier than return, lovelier than sailing in the decked ships to their own native land. As in dark forests, measureless along the crests of hills, a conflagration soars, and the bright bed of fire glows for miles, now fiery lights from this great host in bronze played on the earth and flashed high into heaven. And as migrating birds, nation by nation, wild geese and arrow-throated cranes and swans, over Asia's meadowland and marshes around the streams of Castrios, with giant flight and glorying wings keep beating down in tumult on that verdant land that echoes to their pinions, even so, nation by nation, from the ships and huts, this host debouched upon Scamander Plain. With noise like thunder pent in earth under their trampling, under the horses' hooves, they filled the flowering land beside Scamander, as countless as the leaves and blades of spring. So, too, like clouds of buzzing, fevered flies that swarm about a cattle stall in summer when pails are splashed with milk, so restlessly by thousands moved the fighters of Achaia over the plain, lusting to rend the Trojans. But just as herdsmen easily divide their goats when herds have mingled in a pasture, so these were marshaled by their officers to one side and the other, forming companies for combat. Agamemnon's lordly mien was like the mien of Zeus whose joy is lightning, oaken wasted as ours, god of war, he seemed, and deep chested as Lord Poseidon, and as a great bull in his majesty tower supreme amid a grazing herd, so on that day Zeus made the son of Atreus tower over his host, supreme among them. Tell me now, muses, dwelling on Olympos, as you are heavenly, and are everywhere, and everything is known to you while we can only hear the tales and never know who were the Dane and lords and officers? The rank and file I shall not name, I could not, if I were gifted with ten tongues and voices unfaltering, and a brazen heart within me, unless the muses, daughters of Olympian Zeus beyond the storm cloud, could recall all those who sailed for the campaign at Troy. Let me name only captains of contingents and number all the ships. Of the Boeotians, Penelios, Latos, Arcasileos, Prathena, and Clonios were captains. 
Boeotians men of Hyria and Aulis, the stony town, and those who lived at Skoinos and Skolos and the Glen of Etionos, Thespia, Graia, round the dancing grounds of Mycalesos, round the walls of Harma, Ilesian, Erythrae, Elian, Hyle and Petian, and Ocalia, and Median, the compact citadel, Copai, Eutresis, this of the doves, those, too, of Coronea, and the grassland of Haliatos and the men who held Plataea town and Gleases, and the people of Lower Thebes, the city ringed with walls, and great Onkestos where Poseidon's grove glitters, and people, too, of Oran, rich in purple wine grapes, and the men of Mid-Eia, Nisa the Blessed, and coastal Anthedon. All these had fifty ships. One hundred twenty Boeotian fighters came in every ship. Their neighbours of Aspaldon, then, and Minyan or Caminos, Ascalaphos their captain with El Minos, both sons of Ars, both conceived in actor s manner by severe Astioch, who kept a tryst with Ars in the women's rooms above, where secretly the strong god lay beside her. Thirty ships these Minions drew up in line of battle. Phocians in their turn were led by Scedios and by Epistrophos, the sons of Iphitos Norbolides, that hero, Phocians dwelling in Kyparissos, Rocky Pytho, Cresa the Holy, Panopeus and Dorlis, near Anemorea, Hyampolis, and by the side of noble Kephasos, or in Lalea, where that river rises. Forty black ships had crossed the sea with these, who now drew up their companies on the flank of the Boeotians, and armed themselves. The Locrians had Aias for commander, Oilia's son, that Aias known as the short one as being neither tall nor great compared with Aias Telemonios. A corslet all of linen he wore, and could outthrow all Hellenes and Achaeans with a spear. His were the Locrians who lived at Kynos and Opois and Calieros, Bessa and Scarf and the pretty town Orgii, Tarf and Thronian that lie on both sides of the stream Boagrios. Aias led forty black ships of the Locrians who lived across the channel from Euboia. Men of that island, then, the resolute Abants, those of Chalces, Eritrea, and Histiaea, of the laden vines, Corinthos by the sea, the crag of Dion, those of Caristos, those of Styra all who had young Elephina Chalcodontiades, the chief of the Abants, for commander. Quick on their feet, with long scalp locks, those troop enlisted hungering for body armor of enemies to pierce with ashen spears, and Elephina's black ships numbered forty. Next were the men of Athens, that strong city, the commonwealth protected by Erechtheus. He it was whom Athena, Zeus' daughter, cared for in childhood in the olden time though he was born of plowland kind with grain. She placed him in her city, in her shrine, where he receives each year, with bulls and rams, the prayers of young Athenians. Their commander here at Troy was Pto's son, Menestheus. No soldier born on earth could equal him in battle at maneuvering men and horses though Nestor rivaled him, by grace of age. In his command were Athens' fifty ships. Great Aias led twelve ships from Salamis and beached them where Athenians formed for battle. Then there were those of Argos, those of Tyrins, fortress with massive walls, Hermione and a scene that lie upon the gulf, Troizen, Ionai, the vineyard country of Epidauros, Aegina and Marses, these Diams, lord of the battle cry, commanded with his comrade, Sthenelos, whose father was illustrious Caponius, and in third place Euryalos, a figure godlike in beauty, son of Machistius, lord to Leonides. Over them all ruled Diams, lord of the battle cry, and eighty black ships crossed the sea with these. Next were the men who held the well built city, Mycenae, and rich Corinth, and Cleonae, and Ornii, and fair Raetheria, and Sicyon, where first Adrestos ruled, Hyperesia, Hilltop Gonoessa, Pelene, and the country round Aegean, and those who held the north coast, Aegialos, with spacious he like. Their hundred ships were under the command of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, he it was who led by far the greatest number and the best, and glorying in arms he now put on. A soldier's bronze distinguished amid heroes for valor and the troops he led to war. Next, those of Lake Daemon, land of gorges, men who had lived at Pharis, Sparta, mess haunted by doves, Brizii, fair Orgii, Amicli, too, and Halos by the sea, and lads and the land around Oitalos, these Menelos Agamemnon's brother, lord of the war cry, led with sixty ships, and drawn up separately from all the rest they armed, as Menelos on his own burned to arouse his troops to fight. He burned to avenge the struggles and the groans of Helen. Next came the men of Pylos and Arene, that trim town, and Thryon where they ford Alpheos river, Ape high and stony, Kyperiseus, Amphigenia, and Telios and Halos Dorton, too, where once the Muses, meeting Tamaris, the Thracian, on his way from Oikalia from visiting Eurios, the Oikalian ended his singing. Pride had made him say he could outsing the very Muses, daughters of Zeus who bears the storm cloud for a shield. For this affront they blinded him, bereft him of his god-given song, and stilled his harping. 
the countrymen of Pylos were commanded by Nestor of Gerenia, charioteer, whose ninety-decked ships lined the shore. Then came the troops who had their homes in Arcadia under Kaleen Crag, close-order fighters who lived around the tomb of Apatos, at Phenios, and at Orchaminos where there are many flocks, at Ripe, too, at Straiti, and in the windy town in Esp, men of Tagi and lovely Mantinea, men of Stymphalos and Parhasi, all of whom were led by Agapana, son of Ancaios, and he commanded sixty ships. Arcadians able in war had thronged to go aboard, for the Lord Marshal Agamemnon lent those ships in which they crossed the wine-dark sea, as they had none, nor knowledge of seafaring. Next were the soldiers from Buprasian and gracious Ellis all that plain confined by Hermin and Mercenos, and by Aelzion and the Olenian rock. These had four captains with ten ships apiece, on which the Epeoi had embarked in throngs. Some served under Amphimarchos and Thalpios, grandsons of Acta, sons of Cteatos and of Eurytos. Powerful Dior's Amarinkides commanded others, and Polyxenos led the fourth division son of Agasthenes Orgiates. Then came the islanders from Dulichian and the Echinades, all those who dwelt opposite Elis, over the open sea, Megs their captain, Megs Phylides begotten by that friend of Zeus, the horseman Phileus, who withdrew to Dulichian in anger at his father long ago. Forty black ships had crossed the sea with Megs. Odysseus, then, commanded the brave men of Cephalenia, islanders of Ithaca and Neritos whose leafy heights the sea wind ruffles, and the men of Crocolea, of Aegilips the rocky isle, and those of Samos and Zakynthos, those as well who held the mainland eastward of the islands. Odysseus, peer of Zeus in forethought, led them in twelve good ships with cheek paint at the bows. Thoas, Andraman's son, led the Aetolians, inhabitants of Pluran, Olinos, Pylene, seaside Chalces, Caledon of rocky mountain sites, Thoas their leader because the sons of Oinius were no more, and red-haired Meliagros too was dead. Command of all had thus devolved on Thoas, and forty black ships crossed the sea with him. Idomeneus, famed as a spear fighter, led the Cretans, all who came from Knossos, Gortin, the town of many walls, and Lictos, Miletos, and Lycostos, gleaming white, Phaistos, and Rishon, those pleasant towns all from that island of a hundred cities served under Idomeneus, the great spearman, whose second in command, Meriones, fought like the slaughtering god of war himself. Eighty black ships had crossed the sea with these. Tlepolemos, the son of Heracles, had led nine ships from Rhodes, impetuous men, the Rhodians, in three regional divisions, Lindos, Ielisos, and bright Chimeros, serving under Tlepolemos, the spearman, whose mother, Astiochia, had been taken by Heracles, who brought her from Ephora out of the Celius River Valley, where he had plundered many noble towns. No sooner was Tlepolemos of age than he had killed his father's uncle, old Lycimnios, Alcmenes' warrior brother, and fitting out his ships in haste, he sailed over the deep sea, taking many with him in flight from other descendants of heralds. Wandering, suffering bitter days at sea, he came at last to Rhodes. The island, settled in townships, one for each of three great clans, was loved by Zeus, ruler of gods and men, and wondrous riches he poured out upon them. Nereus had led three well-found ships from Sime Nereus, Aglaia's child by Lord Coropos Nereus, of all Danans before Troy most beautifully made, after Achilles, a feeble man, though, with a small contingent. Then those of Niceros and Carpathos and Kasos and the island town of Kos, ruled by Euripilos, and the Calidnae, islands ruled by Phidippos and Antiphos, the sons of Thessalos, a son of Heracles. Thirty long ships in line belong to these. Tell me now, muse, of those from that great land called Argos of Pelasgians, who lived at Alos, at Alope, and at Trechis, and those of Thyre, those of Hellas, lands of lovely women, all those troops they called the Myrmidons and Hellenes and Achaeans, led by Achilles, in their fifty ships. But these made no advances now to battle, since he was not on hand to dress their lines. No, the great runner, Prince Achilles, lay amid the ships in desolate rage for Briseis, his girl with her soft tresses the prize he captured, fighting all the way, Romlernesos after he stormed that town and stormed the walls of Thabe, overthrowing the spearmen, mines and epistrophos, sons of Ueno Silipiades. For her his heart burned, lying there, but soon the hour would come when he would rouse. Next were the men of Philake, and those who held Pyrrhosos, Garden of Demeter, Iton, maternal town of grazing flocks, Antron beside the water, and the beds of meadow grass at Telios, all these were under Protosilaus' command when that intrepid fighter lived but black earth held him under now, and grieving at Philake with lacerated cheeks his bride was left, his house unfinished there. Plunging ahead from his long ship to be first man ashore at Troy of all Achaeans, he had been brought down by a dard and spear. 
by no means were his troops without a leader, though sorely missing him, they had Podax, another soldier son of Iphiclos Philokides, master of many flocks Podax, Protosilaus' blood brother, a younger man, less noble. But the troops were not at all in want of a commander, though in their hearts they missed the braver one. Forty black ships had sailed along with him. Next were the soldiers who had lived at Farai by the Great Lake, at Glaphirai and Boib, and in the well-kept city, Iarolkos. Of their eleven ships Admetos' son Eumelos had command the child conceived under Admetos by that splendid queen, Alcestis, Pelias' most beautiful daughter. Next, those of Methone and Thormachy, of rugged Olazon and Meliboya. These in their seven ships had been commanded at first by Philoctetes, the great archer. Fifty oarsmen in every ship, they came as expert archers to the Trojan War. But he, their captain, lay on Lemnos Isle in anguish, where the Achaeans had marooned him, bearing the black wound of a deadly snake. He languished there, but soon, beside the ships, the Argives would remember and call him back. Meanwhile his men were not without a leader though missing Philoctetes, Medon led them, Oileus' bastard son, conceived by Rhene under Oileus, raider of cities. Next were the men of Trike and Ithome, that Rocketeris town, and Oikalia, the city of Eurytos, over these two sons of old Asclepios held command both skilled in healing, Podolarios and Machaon. Thirty decked ships were theirs. Next were the soldiers from Ormenios and from the river source at Hyperiae, those of Astion and those below Titano's high snow whitened peaks. Eurypylos, Euaemon's shining sun, led all of these, with forty black ships under his command. Then those who held Argissa and Gertone, Orth, Elone, and the limestone city Oleusen, led by a dauntless man, Polypoites, the son of Perithous, whom Zeus, the Undying, fathered. Polypoites had been conceived by gentle Hippodamea under Perithous, that day he whipped the shaggy centaurs out of Pele and routed them, drove them to the Aethikes. Polypoites' as co-commander had Leontius, son of Coronos Kyneides. Forty black ships had crossed the sea with these. Gunius commanded twenty-two from Kyphos. The Enneans and the brave Pereboi served under him, all who had had their homes around Dodona in the wintry north and in the fertile vale of Titeressos. Lovely that gliding river that runs on into the Paneos with silver eddies and rides it for a while as clear as oil a branch of Styx, on which great oaths are sworn. The magnets were led by Prothous, Tenthred and Son, by Paneos they lived and round Mount Pelion's shimmering leafy sides. Forty black ships had come with Prothous. These were the lords and captains of the Danans. But tell me, muse, of all the men and horses who were the finest, under Agamemnon? As for the battle horses, those were best that came from fierce pastures, and Eumelos drove those mares, as fleet as birds a team perfectly matched in colour and in age, and level to a hair across the nippers. Apollo of the silver bow had bred them in parade as fearsome steeds of war. Of all the fighting men, most formidable was Aeus Telamonios that is while great Achilles rage apart. Achilles towered above them all, so did the stallions that drew the son of Peleus in the war. But now, amid the slim sea-going ships he lay alone and raged at Agamemnon, marshal of the army. And his people, along the shore above the breaking waves, with discus throw and javelin and archery sported away the time. Meanwhile their teams beside the chariots tore and champed at clover and parsley from the marshes, the war cars shrouded in canvas rested in the shelters, and, longing for their chief, beloved in war, the Myrmidons, icily throughout the camp, drifted and took no part in that day's fighting. But now the marching host devoured the plain as though it were a prairie fire, the ground beneath it rumbled, as when Zeus the lord of lightning bolts, in anger at Typhaeus, lashes the earth around Inaramos, where his tremendous couch is said to be. So thunderously groaned the earth under the trampling of their coming on, and they consumed like fire the open plain. Iris arrived now, running on the wind, as messenger from Zeus beyond the storm cloud, bearing the grim news to the men of Troy. They were assembled, at the gates of Priam, young men and old, all gathered there, when she came near and stood to speak to them, her voice most like the voice of Priam's son Polites. Forward observer for the Trojans, trusting his prowess as a sprinter, he had held his post mid plain atop the burial mound of the patriarch Azetes, waiting there to see the Achaeans leave their camp and ships. In his guise, she who runs upon the wind, Iris, now spoke to Priam, Sir, old sir, will you indulge inordinate talk as always, just as in peacetime? Frontal wars upon us. Many a time I've borne a hand in combat, but never have I seen the enemy in such array, committed, every man, uncountable as leaves, or grains of sand, advancing on the city through the plain. 
Hector, you are the one I call on, take action as I direct you, the allies that crowd the great town speak in many tongues of many scattered countries. Every company should get its orders from its own commander, let him conduct the muster and the sortie. Hector punctiliously obeyed the goddess, dismissed the assembly on her terms, and troops ran for their arms. All city gates, wide open, yawned, and the units poured out, foot soldiers, horses and chariots, with tremendous din. Rising in isolation on the plain in face of Troy, there is a ridge, a bluff open on all sides, Briar Hill they call it. Men do, that is, the immortals know the place to be the Amazon Myrines tomb. Anchored on this the Trojans and allies formed for battle. Tall, with helmet flashing, Hector, great son of Priam, led the Trojans, largest of those divisions and the best, who drew up now unarmed, and hefted spears. The Dardans were commanded by Aeneas, whom ravishing Aphrodite had conceived under Anchises in the vales of Ida, lying, immortal, in a man's embrace. His co-commanders were Antinor's sons, both battle-wise, Archilochos and Akamas. Then those from Zalea, the lower slope of Ida Trojans, men of means who drank the waters of Isipo's dark and still they served under Lycaon's shining sun, Pandaros, whom Apollo taught the bow. Adrestia's men, those of the hinterland of Apizos, Pitea, the crag of Treria all these Adrestos led with Amphios of the Linenquiras, both sons of Merops Pacogios, the seer profoundest of all seers, he had refused to let them take the path of war man-wasting war but they were heedless of him, driven onward by dark powers of death. Then, too, came those who lived around Pacote, at Praxion, at Cestus and Abydos, and old Arisbe, Asios their captain, Asios Herticides who drove great sorrel horses from Celius River. Hippothous led the tough Pelasgians from Larissa's rich plowland Hippothous and the young soldier Pileos, both sons of the Pelasgian Lethos Teutomides. Then Thracians from beyond the strait, all those whom Helias rushing water bounded there, Akamas led, and the veteran Perus. Son of Troizeno's Kedes, Euphemos led the Caconis from their distant shore, and those more distant archers, Pionis, Pyratmes led from Amadon, from Axios bemirroring all the plain. The Paphlagonians followed Pylamenes, shaggy, great-hearted, from the wild mule country of the Enitoi men who held Ketoros and Sesamos and had their famous homes on the Parthenios riverbanks, at Croma, Aegialos, and lofty Erythinoi. Odios and Epistrophos were captains of Halizones from Alibi, far eastward, where the mines of silver are. The Mysians Chromis led, with Enomos, reader of bird flight, signs in flurrying wings would never save him from the last dark wave when he went down before the battering hands of the great runner, Achilles, in the river, with other Trojans slain. The Phrygians were under Phorkes and Ascanios from distant Ascani ready fighters. The Lydians, then, Myones, had for leaders Mestals and Antiphos, these were the sons born by Gyge Lake to Telamenes. They led men bred in vales under Mount Molos. Nast commanded Carians in their own tongue, men of Miletos, Thyran's leafy ridge, Myandros rills, and peaks of Mycale. All these Amphimarchos and Nast's led, Nomians shining children. Wearing gold, blithe as a girl, Nast had gone to war, but gold would not avail the fool to save him from a bloody end. Achilles Iacides would down him in the river, taking his golden ornaments for spoil. Sarpedon led the Lycians, with Glaucos, from Lycia far, from whirling Xanthos.